Well, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to the feedback, um, especially from, from us, but I know also other people have um, worked on, on uh, this topic, which I have not until now. Um, here's my title, and here is a better title. Um, which um, corresponds better to the questions that I'm going to address. Here <coughs> are two questions that I'm going to address. Did the Western uh, Scandinavians, and yeah, by the Scandinavians I mean the Germanic Scandinavians and Scandinavia would be only the Scandinavian part of the Nordic countries. So, did the Western Scandinavians, or the Scandinavians, like the Sami and or peoples east of the Baltic, have notions that the polar star was a nail in the top of an invisible world pillar? Or did they have notions that the firmament was some kind of gigantic hand mill with this pillar as its hub? The background of the second question is um, the Sampo. Among the Baltic Finns, um, the mythic object Sampo um, seems to have been understood as uh, the world pillar in question one, but also as the nail in top of the world pillar, and also as the firmament understood as a gigantic um, mill revolving around uh, the polar star as well as a magic hand mill that grinded out prosperity for uh, its human owner in mythic times. So, did the Scandinavians have um, notions like this? There seems to be broad agreement that uh, they did not. Scholars do not believe that the polar star among the Scandinavians uh, was understood as a nail um, in uh, the top of an invisible world pillar. Although a few scholars have suggested that something that in that direction may have been the case. And nobody believes that uh, the Scandinavians understood the, uh, the firmament as some kind of gigantic meal. To question one, uh, I will answer a clear yes, supported by an important cultural puzzle that uh, has not uh, been noticed uh, so far. Regarding question two, there is some evidence that suggests a yes. First, um, a few um, general considerations uh, on the question of additional form uh, information. Is there additional information that we can use? Uh, and I think there is, yes. Um, the finno uric peoples have always lived in close contact um, to, um, and uh, lived close to and in close contact with uh, the Scandinavians. And um, heaven nail or heaven nail star notions are found um, all the way um, to the extreme east of Siberia. So, uh, and that's because such notions are very natural in uh, northern countries uh, because here the firmament, firmament actually does appear to revolve around uh, a fixed star, the northern uh, the polar star. The firmament uh, does appear to revolve around uh, the polar star, uh, which is a fixed point. So that's what can be observed. So this is, uh, notions like, like this are very natural on that background. And, and because of these two reasons, I would say that we should expect um, that the world pillar, polar star, nail uh, notions among uh, the Scandinavians as well, because they see the same sky as the other people in northern Eurasia. Then a few arguments uh, mentioned by other scholars, um, most clearly by Ulrich, Axel Ulrich, in an article from 1910, 
and uh, Drobin and Kainanen in an article from 2001 uh, about Scandinavian indications of uh, the polar star understood as a nail in the top of an invisible world. Firstly, um, the South Sami term um, Vera van Troelten for the polar star uh, literally means the world's pillar and Veralden, the, which is a genitive, uh, was borrowed from um, Old Scandinavian Veraldar, which means the, the world's um, and this indicates that uh, the Scandinavians had notions of the mentioned kind at the time of the borrowing and secondly Cultic pillars, uh, like the pagan Saxons' is, uh, Irminsul, uh, the mighty pillar, are generally understood as cultic representations of uh, the world pillar. Thirdly, Urbygya Saga and uh, Landnoma Bok mention such cultic pillars with nails in their tops. Uh, in western Norway and Iceland, called Regin Naglar, uh, which means the gods', gods is nails or mighty nails. And um, as Drubin and Kainan uh, point out, um, there is reason to believe that such cultic pillars were microcosmos representations of the world pillar that supported the polar star. Because from 17th and 18th century Sami areas, we know such cultic pillars uh, with nails uh, in their tops. And this clearly reflects ideas known among the Sami and eastwards uh, that the polar star is a nail in the top of an invisible world pillar. The polar star is widely referred to as the northern nail or the world's pillar, which I've mentioned. Uh, already and from the Sami, we know cultic pillars that were intended to symbolically um, support uh, heaven. So um, the cultic pillars with Regin Naglar seem to uh, be indirect evidence of uh, Scandinavian notions of the polar star as the nail in the top of an invisible pillar. Finally, the term, uh, there's a term, Veraldar uh, Nagli, uh, which is a, some a Haiti, um, poetic uh, term for a nail, mentioned in one of the manuscripts of Snorri's Edda. As, and as was first pointed out by uh, uh, Axel Odrik, it's hard not to understand uh, this term, Veraldar Nagli, as reflection of the outlined notions. The world's nail would be uh, the nail that holds the firmament in place, uh, which is an idea that we know from Finno Ugric areas. Regrettably, however, this information is not conclusive. There's no clear Old Norse evidence of an invisible pole up to the North Star. Uh, understood as a pivot point. But there is overlooked evidence. There is an Icelandic uh, term, Hjarastjarna, uh, for the polar star, um, attested only in, early, uh, in the early 19th century in Iceland. But in all probability, it's ancient because. Uh, its literal meaning reflects the mentioned notions. Literally, it means the hinged star, cognate with Finnish um, Taiwan Saruman, which means heaven's hinge, which is um, a variant alongside with Hokian Naula, uh, the north nail, or Taiwan Tati, heaven's pivot. Uh, Napathahti, uh, Hubstar, etc., which all reflect the idea that the polar star and the invisible pole <coughs> supporting it is a hub around which the firmament revolves.
Here is a bit more about the background of uh, the Kjara Stjadna. You see here, yeah. Different uh, old Germanic languages uh, had uh, this, this uh, word in it meaning uh, a hinge, so clearly it's an ancient word. The old type of hinge, hinges, with, which Hjallastadnia uh, probably referred to, is shown here. It has pivot, uh, it's, um, yeah, pivot hinges with pivots in the top uh, and the bottom uh, of the door frame. Here's a primitive version of that. And in Scandinavia, you can still see this type of door or hinges on um, old, really old log houses and outhouses. So, you see here, this primitive um, gate can swing freely all the way over there. So, Ichara Stjadna would be a, a, a star uh, that swings like this, or is, is a pivot um, like, like this. This background um, implies that uh, the term Kjara Stjadna reflects um, an idea that the fuller star was the top of a um, pillar rotating like this. Now, if we combine this with Regin Nagler in, in Erbega Saga, Kjara Stjadna makes, very, uh, makes it very probable that the, med the medieval Scandinavians had um, well, that they could understand uh, the polar star as a pivot of heaven and a nail, a regin nagli in the top of a pillar supporting the firmament. Some might argue that um, we should hesit hesitate to draw this conclusion because um, the direct evidence is too weak. Isn't it suspicious that um, it is not directly mentioned in the um, sources? Well, then we should have in mind that an elaborate indigenous astronomy uh, with myths uh, connected to it must have existed in the Nordic countries, like in more or less all other countries uh, or the cultures in the world. It must have been an indigenous uh, astronomy. Even though uh, the surviving evidence of it is very limited. Absence of evidence is not, not evidence of absence. Uh, the indigenous astronomy must have been there, and when in a few cases it's possible to uh, reconstruct parts of it with uh, quite high prob probability, I think that is a good option. Now, uh, let's return to the questions. Um, that was the first question. Then I'll turn to the second question, uh, which implies that we should search for parallels to um, Sampo in Scandinavia. So let's take a closer look at uh, Sampo. The Sampo is um, among the Baltic fins. Um, Sampo seems to have been uh, the world pillar, probably functioning as a cosmic hub, but also uh, the firmament revolving around the polar star, uh, understood as a gigantic mill, as well as a magic hand mill that grinded out prosperity for its human owner in metric times. Um, Although I'm not sure that um, all three meanings are re recognized by the scholarly community as equally valid, uh, I have the impression that uh, there's a tendency to insist that Sampo really is only one of these things. But as far as I can see, there's very solid documentation for all three points, and I cannot see why uh, this complexity of meanings should be problematic in any way. Now, um, the question is, uh, the parallels, possible parallels in Scandinavia. And uh, we've discussed the possible parallels uh, to, to the world pillar part. And uh, point C is also, um, well, point C is not problematic at all, 
there's an undisputed parallel uh, to see, uh, namely in the quern Grotti in the Eddie poem uh, Grotta Songer. It can grind anything that uh, the owner or operator wants, and in the poem it grinds gold, peace, and uh, prosperity, and it grinds an army. Uh, this is also a very widespread folktale folk about it. The problem is B. Is there any Scandinavian evidence that the firmament um, revolving around the polar star was understood as a gigantic myth? Here is um, Clive Tollis' answer to that question. He is the person who has um, worked the most on the comparison of uh, the Sampo and the Grotti um, and Old Norse mill motives in general. Tolle says that Grotti may show little indication of being a form of world pillar as the Sampo appears to be or of carrying out its milling on a mythologically significant cosmic level. Yet, both motifs may be glimpsed elsewhere in Norse poems. So, the essential point is this. Milling on a mythologically significant cosmic level. Little the indication of that. I'll now give you the most convincing of the glimpses mentioned here. Um, then I will disagree with this point. Uh, and I should mention that um, the mill motives and the possible connections uh, with Sampo was first pointed out by Victor Ried work from 1886. Here, about through this mall, 23, the first glimpse uh, with Tolle's translation. <coughs> The stanza says that um, the father of the sun and the moon turns heaven by uh, every day to regulate time. Most scholars have translated cuerva as uh, traverse, but as Tolly uh, points out, such a use of cuerva would be unparalleled. Turned, make revolt, uh, seems to be, uh, well, to me, it seems to be the only possible reading. And in this stanza, it's also tempting to um, understand this part, Mondel and Mondelföre, as um, Mondol, which is a standard Old Norse um, term for the handle of the corn, which you can see here. This is a um, Stone quern, rotary quern with um, with the handle here, referred to as a mondol in Old Norse. Sorry, is this only this thing in the middle is mondol or the whole mill? Not this, but this, the handle. Like the handle. Pull this handle <coughs> to make the quern go round. <coughs> so it's <coughs> Mondel in Mondelföre is the same word as this Mondol, then it would make very good sense uh, because then Mondelföre would mean the mover of uh, the quern handle, which would fit very well. Um, also, because um, if the world is conceived of as a gigantic quern uh, with a firmament corresponding to the upper stone, then the handle, it, it, the handle is outside of the firmament. The firmament is above us, and the handle that pulls, pulls it around will be on the back side of the firmament. So, so that would fit, uh, because uh, Mondil Före is the, not the son of the moon, he's the father of the sun and the moon. So it would fit that he's outside of everything. And I should mention that in, in Volus 4, 5, the sun has hands capable of grasping. As pointed out by Tom. If 
we conceive of the world mill in this way, uh, the Mundil Ferry interpretation fits even better than in Tolle's own uh, conception of a mill, which is based upon this type of mill. This is uh, Tolle's own uh, reconstruction uh, illustration. He um, thinks it's essential that the, the quern has this type of handle. Um, a long handle uh, and a frame holding the upper end of it. Tolle argues that uh, the handle of the mill corresponds to the world pillar and thus that the world um, mill idea presupposes this type of mill. Uh, but that doesn't fit for at least uh, two reasons. Firstly, uh, the world pillar does not move around in circles. To the contrary, it's the immovable point. That, that's uh, the essential uh, essence, essence of, of the idea is about um, but, but the handle moves around in circles. Secondly, if the world is a mill, then we live inside the mill uh, with a lower, lower immo immovable uh, stone as, as the ground we, we walk, and uh, the upper revolving stone uh, as the firmament, and that leaves the handle outside of uh, the firmament. So the, 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 the world pillar. Well, then it, yeah, to me at least, it doesn't fit that that the handle outside the firmament would, would be the one fit. So, yeah, the model seems to, to leave the handle outside, perhaps with the father of the sun and the moon moving the handle. Now, you might think that it can't be very nice to live between these two stones. Um, so the world mill uh, metaphor doesn't fit uh, completely no matter how we understand it. Uh, but the essential idea seems to be that um, the revolving part is above us. In that case, the world pillar is the peg, this would be the world pillar, the peg in the middle that keeps the upper stone in place. However, it's somewhat problematic to uh, take Mondil in Mondil Föri as the same as Mondor, a problematic formally. Uh, the Ull Elusif would have many parallels, but uh, Mond, uh, uh, Mond is more problematic. I have to look deeper into that. I, it may be possible. Then another point, um, Wallace Spor, 6 to 8, that's, this is in the, the, the part where the gods found uh, the world and, and their own society, and they found their society in the middle of the world. And it says they, in the text that they meet at Ida Waller, which uh, is most easily understood as Eddie Field. Eddie, that's uh, like a, a world pool uh, to found the society. Um, and that would fit in quite nicely, I would say, because the god gods lived in the middle of the, in the center of the world, uh, and yeah, if the world is revolving, okay, and the eddy fields could fit well in the middle of the world. And I would like to add uh, with Drabin uh, and Kenanan that the Regin Naglar imply revolving, because the idea behind uh, the cosmic nail is that um, they would rep um, the cosmic nail would represent, well, the idea that it would represent is that the firmament is fixed at the point of the polar star around which it revolves. So the point of a nail, a nail fixes something. So there's the world pillar, and then there's a nail in the top needed to, to keep things in place. So that would be the point of the nail. So regular God implied revolving. Here is Tolle's conclusion. In Norse mythological tradition, we find both the notion of the grinding of corn as a symbol of cosmic abundance and the image of the cosmos turning or being turned with a handle uh, in such a way as to regulate time and the abundance of the seasons, which depends upon this regulation. Grotti, however, is primarily an adaptation of the wonder mill. By contrast, 
the Sampa must once have formed an integral part of traditional Finnish cosmology. The highlighting is added here. Um, this point here about the grinding of corn as a symbol of cosmic abundance um, is weakly founded in Tolle's uh, writings. Uh, but I can add from the archaeological material uh, that we know many examples uh, of bread or grinding stones or querns in clearly uh, cultic uh, contexts, not least in, in post holes. Uden Sakvison has written most about this. In any way, the Old Norse record does give us some glimpses of milling on a mythological, mythologically significant cosmic level. But is it correct that Grotti, the corn Grotti in the poem Grotta Sanger, is it correct that Grotti uh, does not have a cos cosmic dimension? and does not have a connection with um, the world pillar? I think it has. And then to go on from here, we need a summary of Grotta Sang. King Frode of Denmark is um, renowned for his peace and his wealth. He buys two strong slave girls from Fenyan Manyan. There are different versions here. This is not uh, said done, this is the poem itself. He buys two strong slave girls, Fenja and Menja, from Sweden. The quernstones that are to form Grotti are found in Denmark and are given to Frodi by a uh, man with a giant's name. Fenja and Menja claim to have discovered these millstones long, long ago. They caused earthquakes when they dislodged the stones from the earth. Grotti would produce whatever the grinder made. No one but Fenya and Menya was strong enough to turn it. Frode made the giantesses grind gold, peace and prosperity. He granted them almost no rest. They sang Grotta Sanger as they worked. Furious at Frode's cruelty to them, they ground out an army, and the sea king, Muesinger, came and slew Frode. Um, in the poem itself, there is merely a foretelling of Frode's overthrow. The corn breaks and the milling must stop in the poem itself. The end of Frodo's reign is marked by thunderings and lightnings, earthquakes, the disappearance of the sun, and the upsetting of prognostications. Um, that's only in, in the Skolding of Sun. Thus, Frodo's peace came to an end. And then there's a conclusion only in prose. We sing a text, Grotif and Jan Mania, he bids them grind salt. They grind until the excess of salt sinks the ship. This causes the sea's saltiness. There is now a whirlpool where the sea fell into the eye of the corn. To me, this seems to be an, a parallel to or an allusion to the cosmic drama in Baldur's Ball. Grotti is clearly more than uh, a magic mill uh, that grinds whatever the, the owner wants. Gros Grotti has cosmic implications. With Grotti, the giantess is grind downfall for uh, the king and the world peace. For the uh, established society, similar to how uh, the giants in Wolospo uh, and other mythological sources caused the downfall of uh, the King Odin and his fellow gods in Ragnarok. In both cases, the ultimate cause for the downfall is the rulers' abuse and exploitation of uh, the giants and their resources, which eventually backfires on the gods. In Grottasong, uh, those who carry this through are two giantesses referred to as Mot Karma Yar. Um, and in Wolospo, the downfall starts when three Fusama Yar or Mot Karma so Mot Karma Yar or Mot Kar, uh, when they come to the gods. And similar to how the bedrock breaks in Ragnarok in Wolospo, in Grotta Sanger, um, Grotti itself breaks when uh, 
the established society is about to fall. So, what happens to Grotti happens to the established society. Um, the fates of Grotti and the established society are interconnected. And in the prose version of the Grotti myth, the end of Frodi's reign is uh, marked by earthquakes and the disappearance of the sun, uh, similar to what happens in Ragnarok. <coughs> to me, it seems uh, clear that the Grotti myth has two levels. Uh, one prosaic level and one cosmic level. If this is correct, Grotti comes close to Sampo in this duality, because then the missing cosmic dimension uh, has been, uh, or can be, identified. On this background, the name Grotti becomes interesting. Why is Grotti called Grotti? Uh, Grotti is a term um, for one part of a rotary core. Uh, a Grotti is really the nave of the lower stone, the support for the mills, mills central ax, uh, axle, that's in, in Shetland English, Norwegian affair we see it here. This is the Grotti. Grotti is um, the shaft in which the peg, <coughs> you remember the peg from the other, um, other figure? There's supposed to be a peg fastened in this hole, and uh, it goes all the way up here, and it keeps the upper stone in place when it revolves. And then you, you drop the grain uh, here, and the peg doesn't fill the hole completely, so the grain falls down here. But the peg, uh, yeah, is here. Now, in Baltic fin Finnish languages, this peg that is has rot away on this archaeological find, but in a way it's called um, Sampa. And Sampa is the word from which Sampo is derived. Um, and Sampo probably, uh, well the complex, the root of meaning probably is, is a pillar. Um, and the word Sampo probably means something uh, fitted with a Sampa. So a Sampo is something fitted with Peg that should sit here. So, if we turn back to the um, world mill uh, metaphor, this peg here would be the world pillar. So, if the poem Grotti. In Grottasanger, on one level, on one level has a cosmic dimension. The name Grotti makes good sense, uh, because then the shaft of uh, Grotti, here on that core, uh, corresponds to the world pillars post hole, so to speak. And uh, the holes that support uh, cultic pillars, they need post holes, so that would be the draw, Grotti. And also, the, the Grotti and, and this, this peg is the very center of, of uh, or essence of the, the corn and, and, uh, and everything. So, um, the Sampa is the peg, and, and uh, the Grotti is, is the hole that supports the Sampa. This means that uh, there seems to be, seem to be uh, similar ideas um, in the names Grotti and Sampa. Some of you might be thinking about the world tree, world, world axis, what about the world tree? Um, it's not a problem, uh, there's not a contradiction between notions of a world pillar in a strict sense and, and um, a world tree with branches and, and leaves. Uh, throughout Northern Eurasia, uh, the polar star can be conceived of as a nail in the top of an invisible pillar and as the top of a tree on which uh, the constellation animals graze animals in the sky, constellation animals, and they graze on, on this tree. So, 
here is my conclusion. The questions that I started out with. Uh, to sum up, my answer to question one has been a clear yes, based on Regen Nagler, understood as uh, understood on the Sami background, and the overlooked term Kjarastjatna. Um, I am not so sure about question two, but there is at least one clear reflection of uh, belief in revolving uh, in a in a revolving world in the Old Norse record in the Valtrudo de Small, uh, the Kvarva, uh, turning of the sky, um, and the corn grotti in Grottasanger seems to have a cosmic dimension, and the literal meaning of the name grotti. See, uh, comes close to the ideas behind uh, the name Sampo. Finally, I uh, thought about approaches. I think we should search more for cultural fossils like Chiara Stjärna, because they are capable of um, giving us information of the times in which uh, they were formed. Now, some of you, like Janna, this is what you do all the time, well, at least much of your time, uh, try to, to find information in, in, in uh, words, their original meaning and their borrowing and so on. Um, without outwit linguistics, it's, it's not very common to do that, but it's also completely possible for, for non-linguists to, to do this. For example, Chiara Stjärna, it doesn't take uh, much linguistic competence to, to use that, that, uh, that term and get the information out of it. Um, what we have to do to uh, use that uh, kind of information is first to look for it. And it doesn't have to be uh, difficult. In this case, I just looked up Polarstern in, in this work. Handwörterbuch des Deutschen Arbeitslandes. It's a very useful work. So I just looked it up and I found it. Nobody else that had used it? Not at all. So, Handwörterbuch. It has only 10 volumes, so you can easily, easily <laughs> carry it. So, thank you.